Hi and good morning, everyone, uh, in person and uh, abroad and on Zoom. Hi, everyone. So this is our first panel, the classics in the modern world, and I think uh, we have a nice transition from the previous uh, from the previous uh, greetings to this panel. Our first speaker is uh, Chris Bishop. Hi, joining us from uh, Australia. So uh, good afternoon, Chris. And Dr. Chris Bishop is a lecturer in the Center for Classical Studies at the Australian National University in Canberra, where he teaches Lat Latin using the contextual introduction methods of Hans Orberg, Lingua Latina per se illustrata. His areas of research include classical philology and literature and reception studies. His most recent monograph was Medieval medievalist comics and the America century in 2016. And uh, Chris is going to talk to us today on accounting for the dominance of didactic methods in the teaching of Latin. So Chris, uh, the stage is yours. Do you have um, uh, to share, do you need to share a paper or something? Yeah, I can, I can share some slides. So okay. shall I do that? Uh, you have, uh, does he have the share screen option? Okay. okay. <laughs> Good? Yeah, good, okay, fantastic. Well, um, yes, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be talking about um, accounting for the dominance of dedu deductive methods and teaching. I'm gonna be talking about lots and lots of things. I've got 20 minutes, correct? So I'm just gonna rack a whole lot of stuff in there 20 minutes and we'll see where we end up talking, okay? Um, I should say, um, thank you very much for having me um, into your country. I'm actually on someone else's country at the moment. I'm uh, an Australian. I need to acknowledge the fact that I'm, I'm presently operating out of Ngunnawal, Ngambri country. And uh, the, the people who are the custodians of this country are uh, doing me a great privilege by allowing me to be here. So I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Please, Chris, just a moment. Sorry to, to, for interrupting. We are trying to... Um, to um increase the volume just a moment because we can't hear you uh, correctly. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Chris. That's uh, all right. Continue. Sorry. Now we can hear you better. Thank you. You, you hear me okay now? Fantastic. All right. I was just acknowledging country. So um, I'm on the Gunnel and the Gambri country, and I just like to acknowledge the, uh, the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on and to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm just going to. Yeah, good. This, uh, this started off as a, as a paper, the paper, it's been accepted for, for a publication and um, it started off as a paper like you uh, as you very kindly introduced me. I, I do work with uh, inductive systems of, of language, but I was, I was really interested and I like it. It's, um, it, it's, it, we had a really positive experience with uh, working at my university here and it's obviously the, the dominant mode for teaching modern languages, but I was really interested as to understand why it, um, it retains, it, it, it's, it's hasn't really sunk into a lot of classics teaching. Classics teaching tends to still be deductive. And so I was interested in that even, um, and when I say deductive, I'm going to be talking about like whether it's a, you're talking about a grammar translation model or a classical traditional uh, grammar dictionary, uh, three P's, whatever it is. Um, we, we have a situation where, um, giving you some quotes there from, from some um, Fritches, Rogers and, and Skahan, you know, you know, the deductive method is a method which there's no theory, no literature offers a rational justification for attempts to relate to issues in linguistics, you know, described as a discredited meaning impoverished methodology given that why do we continue to do it in classics i guess was the question i started off with and where i ended up with was looking at some really interesting people and um and coming up with some interesting ideas so 
let's just go through those. And we'll, we'll, there we go. You okay? I'm just going to keep going. Um, interestingly, uh, originally um, the um, the inductive model. Get lots of feedback here. Is that a, oh, I'm just going to keep going. Originally, the inductive model was the only model there was, right? So um, uh, basically, you learn Latin and you learn ancient Greek, uh, speaking Latin and ancient Greek, and it was until relatively recent, uh, until relatively late. Um, Milton learned that way. Uh, Locke thought it was a, the dominant way. But there was a big change, um, I guess, at the beginning of the 18th century. And um, it was then that, uh, that basically, I, I, you know, um, Ruddiman is a big one of this, if you, if you know your, uh, your history of uh, Latin teaching. Uh, Johnson has started off, he actually criticises the early system of Lilly, but Thomas Ruddiman is, the, uh, is the, the, the great teacher of Latin who changed it. So moving from an inductive system where you learnt Latin in Latin, or you learnt Greek in Greek, he decided it was better to start learning it from a, a grammar, like learn the grammar, uh, the application, and then later move on from there. And after Ruddiman's Rudiments of the Latin Tongue in 1714, there's this plethora of work that comes out uh, in the 18th century. Um, and I'm just putting that in there because I'm not going to talk much about this sort of stuff, but it's interesting that there was a lot of literature in 18th century um, England, which predated um, the, the, the great doyen of the uh, deductive system, which is uh, a Meidinger. Um, now, Meidinger didn't teach classics, but he became the big poster boy for the way languages should be taught for a very long time. And um, when Viator eventually you know, criticizes the deductive method, it's, it's Meidinger he has particularly in mind. And he's a, Meidinger's an interesting character to start with. In um, 1779, as I've said here, he applied for a, a license to teach French in Frankfurt. He's only a young fellow at the time, 23. And of course, well, and that actually, that application for license was um, uh, denied. Um, and so he turned to publications soon afterwards. In uh, 83, he published his first uh, practical French grammar. And if you have a look here, this is the, the bit that I love where it says basically, you know, by which you can learn this language in a simple and easy way in a very short time. And uh, I'm not too sure how good at language mining it was, but he came up with this idea that basically uh, you could study it like a mathematical principle, just figure out the grammar, and then, you know, the rest of it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, the system caught on pretty quickly. He had followers very soon. Uh, Johann Fick um, very soon afterwards produces his practical English uh, course for Germans uh, following writing his grammar. And uh, Ultif uh, also produced a practical German grammar a few years after that. So Meidinger had his own stuff out and he also had these, these followers. And I guess I was interested to understand, okay, develops a system, but why did it become so popular? And the thing is that he was very lucky, I think, to produce it at almost exactly the same time that there was this massive burgeoning in the, in the German education system. Obviously, 1794, uh, the, the Prussian general land law was passed and this introduced the, the Volkskul system. And uh, by 1807, uh, there was a director of education established, which was headed by Humboldt, of course, famous educational reformist. And he, of course, championed Latin and, and ancient Greek in these new reformed schools. But it's interesting to think about how these schools, go, uh, what they would have looked like. I'm going to come back to this point at the end because it's going to be significant when I get to the end of my paper. But by 1816, um, in, in Germany, there was 21,766 teachers in 20,345 schools, teaching about... 2 million children. And when you think about those numbers, 20,000 schools, 21,000 teachers, what we're talking about mainly is very, very full, small schools in, in the sense of how much staff. I mean, most of these are one teacher schools. So they're not, you know, big, uh, complex gymnasium that we're expecting. These are just little parish schools with one teacher teaching quite a lot of students. If there's 2 million students between 20,000 schools, and we're talking about you know, 90, between 90 and 95 schools on average per teacher, uh, te uh, school, children per teacher. Um, 30 years later, 46, uh, the numbers are, are still the same. So you're still talking about these, these you know, small schools. And this, these individual single teachers who had all these students under their control had to teach them a whole range of things. They had to teach them, of course, Latin and Greek. How do they do that? What if you, your Latin and your Greek isn't that good? 
And that's where Meidinger came into his own. Um, he was, as I said, he was ideally, ideally positioned to benefit the reforms. Um, and we know that his, his books of, of teaching became the standard apparatus for teaching language in these schools. There's 37 editions of his, his practical French grammar uh, appeared. Uh, he sold you know, a quarter of a million copies in Germany alone. He, he produced a children's version that went to 26 editions. Uh, he then produced textbooks in Italian um, uh, like for, for teaching Italian in German, but also another one in, um, to teach German in French. Um, and people from outside of the, uh, of the education system, people who are fluent in these languages, you know, knew that they were bad books, derided them. In fact, in, you get this, as I said here, this, um, uh, this sort of, uh, you know, this long known anecdote, a joke, the, the Meidinger is a, is a thing you talk about for these bad examples that he had at the back of his book in the, in the appendix up the back, these bad examples of how you wouldn't, well, he was saying this, how you would speak the language because they're not. And this became the dominant thing. Really easy for the single teachers in these uh, tiny schools to teach a range of languages, even when they couldn't, they didn't have particular expertise in the language because they could just teach the grammar. And that made it a whole lot easier for them. And because of the dominance of this, it became known as the Prussian method, which is interesting, I think, because the English had actually been doing it for a century beforehand, but then they um, adopted the Prussian method, or the, the term the Prussian method, because as the Volk school system became really uh, a powerful, um, you know, uh, educational tool, they wanted to adopt that. So they called it the Prussian method. Um, so then we get this reflex in English uh, uh, teaching of, of Latin and, and Greek, uh, where especially during the early part of the, of the 19th century, we get a plethora of these books coming out, uh, these new grammatical deductive methods in, in the pressure, Prussian method, they're saying, even though there was an earlier system that should already be done you know, in English. And so that leads me to a couple of other interesting characters I want to talk about. And the first of them is, is James Hamilton. So he's a, he's a colourful character. Um, He's uh, uh, an Irishman. He learns uh, Latin and Greek uh, from a couple of Jesuit brothers. Um, uh, by the time in his early 20s, he's operating in Paris. Um, he's in uh, Hamburg uh, by the end of the, of the 18th century. And he makes this amazing claim. He becomes this big uh, entrepreneur when he gets to America. And he makes this amazing claim that he learned German from uh, a general Donnelly who was a French immigrant serving with the Austrian army. And he said that he learned German in 12 lessons. And he then proposed that he could teach you any language, which he understood also in 12 lessons. He arrives in America somewhere about 1815. He was actually there. He had migrated with his family, apparently to become a potash farmer, but he quickly uh, got rid of that. And he decided to start teaching languages. And um, he was a bit of a, like I say, interesting character. He sets up these, um, these schools uh, where he guarantees that he'll teach you all these languages in 12 lessons. Um, there's all sorts of controversies and he tends to run from, from city to city. He starts in Philadelphia, pretty soon he's in Baltimore, then he's in Washington, then he's in Boston, he goes across the border into Montreal, eventually he's in, he's in Quebec. And what he seems to have done is develop what he called the Hamiltonian system, which is basically interlinear translations. And uh, he worked with a guy called Thomas Clark uh, to produce uh, these interlinear translations of Caesar, Cicero, Sallust, Juvenal, Livy, Homer, Xenophon. It's possible though that he didn't do this, that in fact, uh, Hamilton and Clark stole the idea from uh, a Reverend Osborne, who was one of Hamilton's early students. Um, Hamilton was in the States for very long. He eventually goes back over to the United Kingdom uh, in 1823. But uh, this Hamilton, Locke and Clark series of, of interlinear transitions um, is, was really popular actually right until the 20th century. It gets published as the Hamilton, Locke and Clark series, although it's actually Osborne, the Reverend Osborne, who was possibly the originator of this, who works together with a, a man called Levi Hart um, to, to produce these. So why it gets called the Hamilton, Locke and Clark series when in fact it's produced by Osborne and Hart it's just an interesting story in itself. Um, and another interesting character who came up as I was doing my, my thing also was um, Edward Pithman, who I found, um, I guess, is using the Prussian system, but to teach um, Latin and Greek. He uh, is born 1804 in uh, Osnabrück, 
his dad's an officer in the second Hanoverian regiment, dies very when boys very young. Um, he Pickman um, goes through a range of universities. He's, he's chucked out of quite a few. And by 1824, he's 20, he finds himself in England where he begins to teach language students. Um, he very quickly also starts to produce these deductive method um, books. He publishes, he publishes his uh, treatise on Latin composition 27. Um, he's uh, also got theoretical practical grammars coming books in 1830, 1832, and by mid 1830s, he's, he's delivering lectures at Oxford and Cambridge, but things start to go bad at that point. He is contracted as a private tutor to a noble family in Dublin, but he has a falling out with them. And uh, he, um, he basically threatens uh, his, uh, his former boss, who then has him chucked into, thrown into prison at Kilmainham. And then from there to the Dublin House of Industry as a, as a you know, classified as a lunatic, it's classified as the same. 36, he's transferred to Dean Swift's hospital. Again, he's diagnosed as, as insane and subsequently confined until mid 1837. Um, he comes out at that point, he's lecturing at the University of Dublin, um, and he's eventually engaged by the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, uh, Lord Fortescue. But then he does this thing in 1840, he, he attempts to gain access to Prince Albert, he, he bursts in on Prince Albert, this sees him declared insane once again, and then he goes to, to Bedlam, to Bedlam Hospital. Um, there's a, he's there for 14 years, uh, locked up in Bedlam, uh, until John Percival, who was the son of the Prime Minister at the time, took, uh, takes up Pakeman's case and secures his release. As soon as he's released, he basically accosts the prince, the, the prince again, um, which sees him thrown back into hospital. Um, and uh, he's only released on the condition that he returns to Germany. So, some of the characters that I uh, carried on, but, but I'm, I'm interested in some other big papers. So, going back to the original thing I was talking about, that you know, the, the, the dominance of these deductive methods. The thing I was interested in, I suppose, was, you know, um, why they became powerful in the in the uh, dominant in the um, in the Prussian schools is because it was very easy for the for the teachers to use them. And John Taylor said he noticed that the, the deductive language. Uh, teaching shifted the burden of class from the teacher to the student. Uh, Johannes Schultz, who was the, the Prussian Minister of Education, recognised that inductive methods were just too hard. They required too much of teachers, especially in these these you know small schools, uh, single teacher schools with with lots of students. Um, and even in America, people who, who tried to promote uh, inductive things like uh, Barna, uh, Barna Spears um, said it's you know it's too difficult. So. Why does deductive method become important? It, it, it goes, I guess it goes back to my thing in the original thing. We heard a bit before about the decline of uh, classics and of introductory speakers. And that's something really interesting to know because it, it dovetails into this. And I'd be happy to talk more about this as well. I don't know what it's like in Israel, but in Australia, we often talk about the you know, massive decline in classics. And it's not actually a massive decline. It's a massive decline from what it was but um, that was itself a ridiculous uh, inflation. And so this is the same thing, it, it happened in Australia and also because we, we sort of piggyback on the same sort of things that happen in America. And so it's a bit far range, but keep with me here. Um, the, the, services re, the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 44, you know, the GI Bill, um, which was then augmented in 52 by another Veterans Readjustment Act. This was the idea that, you know, soldiers who had um, been discharged uh, uh, honorably from the military service and had sent at least 90 days uh, in active service were eligible for a um, grant to take them to college. And by 1955 in the States, uh, more than 2 million um, service personnel, return service personnel, personnel had been able to do that and what that led to is this massive increase in universities so the when we talk about our you know the numbers dropping they're usually dropping historic compared to post-war numbers before the second world war numbers were tiny um and in australia in america uh, and to some extent in, in uh, british universities this is because of these these uh, these deals in america in particular there was a 75 percent increase just in the in the five years after the second world war um, and, and some schools like completely doubled their pre-war numbers. There's another 49% uh, 
uh, increase once the Veterans Readjustment Act went through, and uh, another 120% increase during the 60s. So in fact, the period from you know, 1945 to 1965 was this massive boom in university. So how does that impact classics, I suppose? So what was really interesting is that these things, the idea that people put these things in place is that you know, veterans were going to be uh, encouraged to retrain for practical employment, but they didn't. What they did is they, they gravitated towards liberal arts degrees. And in places like Australia and places like the States, they really gravitated towards classics because they saw this as something that was previously out of their you know, reach. They saw this as something that was aspirational. Um, they wanted to, to go for these sorts of things. So we ended up with these crazy numbers. By 1965, there were 40,000 Americans, for instance, studying Latin at the tertiary level. Um, and classics graduates, and of course, once they graduate, then they become classics teachers. We know that in 1962, there were more than 700,000 high school students in the US enrolled in Latin. So there's this massive boom in the universities post Second World War, which leads to this massive classics boom uh, in the schools as well as that. And so where does that leave us? Well, we have the same situation, basically because there's this massive drive for people to teach um, uh, things like classics, we go back to these deductive methods because they're much easier to do. I don't necessarily have to have great competency in Latin or ancient Greek. I just need to understand the grammar. If I can understand the grammar, then I can teach these courses. And so there's an interesting parallel that came out of the study between basically what happens with, I guess, a language boom in the Volk school system in Prussia um, around the turn of the 19th century and the classics boom that comes out of uh, the, uh, um, the, the increase in students following the Second World War. And I shall finish there and happy to talk more about it if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Will claps in here, which is also a very nice uh, thing. I, I wish so much I was there, I tell you, but anyway. Um, so it's hard to look at you and uh, both of the camera at the same time. Um, sure. So since our panel uh, consists of two very different uh, themed uh, lectures, if you have any questions for Chris from the audience or from uh, the chat, you can uh, take them now. We can take them now. So again, thank you, Chris, for uh, allowing, allowing us to fantasize about two million students. Yeah. Even with the Prussian <laughs> method, it sounds, it sounds really great. Uh, so I have a question from Lisa here in the audience. Yeah, no, no. Can you hear, uh, can you hear Chris? Uh, no. no, okay, uh, so, yeah. Oh, I have, I'll try to unmute. Hi, Chris, it's Lisa. Hey, Lisa, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see, well, sort of see you. <laughs> so I was wondering, in, in Echo, <laughs> Oh, how do we have a mic? I'm going to mute myself again. Once. Okay. Can we, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Ah, perfect. Right. Okay. We're okay. Uh, so I was just wondering about the uh, method that became very popular in, in the UK, at least, which I grew up with, where you don't learn a lot of grammar, but you do a lot of reading. And, I, you know, the reading methods, like the Cambridge course, the Oxford course, which I, I still use here even. And I was wondering if you had any comments about how that fitted into the whole picture uh, you painted, uh, and maybe outside of what you were talking about, but I'm very interested if you have an answer. Yeah, I think, yeah, no, look, like I said, this is... um. It was a really big paper, so I was just, I was just, you know, cherry picking a few things out that I thought people might find interesting. I'm very aware that you're just starting off your day, and I didn't want to sort of get, you know, um, yeah. Look, the English system, I think. So when Hamilton leaves America, he goes back to the UK and he establishes um, um, more schools over there, and he's he's basically the the forerunner of the reading method. He's he believed he said that he had um, learned. Um, Latin and Greek from these Jesuit brothers who just read Latin and Greek to him and then he he figured it out and he says the 12 lessons he had with this mysterious you know General Dongeli which no one can find on any records of course which learned uh, taught him French he 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 said that all he did was just read to him in um sorry read to him in in uh, German and then he could he could speak it 
Um, when he comes back to England, he, uh, although he's only alive for another sort of eight years, he, he spends a, a lot of time um, you know, working on this idea of a reading method and it, get, it gets championed by lots of people. So it, it, it then eventually becomes the basis of the, these things. There's, and, you know, like you know, too, there's also, I mean, so many interesting characters. There's, you know, Rouse, you know, with his, his amazing sort of things going on as well. Um, and he's, he develops that this and then makes it more inductive as well. There's, yeah, there's all sorts of interesting, um, you know, pioneers and characters in the story, which is the thing I got really sidetracked on. I, I just started off interested in just crunching some like statistical numbers, but I kept finding all these stories about these, these characters, but yeah, the reading method in England is definitely, um, a Hamiltonian a thing. Thank you. It's a great paper. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Any other questions? Oh, hmm? oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can uh, also people are connected on Zoom. You can uh, type your question to the chat if you all raise your hand if you have any questions or as we go to uh, to David Chef. No, no, it's uh, from Daniela from earlier, so it's okay. So no, uh, so it's okay. Um, oops. Sorry. Um, so uh, we have here a question for David Chaps. I just wanted to oh, add to um, add two two experiences of mine. Number one, uh, this deductive method—the idea that if you learn the rules, you can know everything quickly—applies not only to grammar, but also to uh, lexicography. And mm -hmm. the principle behind Stephanus's. Uh, dictionary. I, I discovered this when a, a student of mine wrote a, a master's thesis on it, which I hope we'll publish because it's a, he discovered fantastic things. And, uh, and this is uh, be, Stephanus' dictionary is based on the principle that if you know the, the roots, then you'll understand all the words that come to the, the numbers of, of roots aren't that great. And so he's organized everything by roots. It makes it terribly difficult to find a word in a dictionary because nothing is in, or in, in, you have to know in advance what the root is in order to know where to look, at, look it up. But the, the dictionary is not made to look things up. The dictionary is made to learn well, learn the meaning of this and then you will learn all the, uh, if, you know, if, you, if you know what uh, aner is, then you know what androphonos is, then you know what uh, polyandros is, all the other, all the other words uh, all together. And when Stephanus was reprinted re reprinted in England in the uh, early 19th century. The person in charge of that was none other than Valpi, who you, who you had mm. as the author of a number of your books of, uh, of mm. deductive, deductive methods. It was immediately attacked for mm. not putting things in alphabetical order. And the, the Dindorfs put out something in, in, uh, in Paris, which put everything in, in uh, in alphabetical order, which is one that, that people use nowadays. But the principle behind it was exactly the, the, the same idea that if you get, a, the, you know, uh, if you arrange it logically, then you have much less to learn. Mm. And one, the second piece of information, uh, I, one year, uh, our friend here, uh, uh, Professor Ben Isaac, went on sabbatical. And I inherited the second year of his elementary Greek class, which he had been teaching by the immersion method, with a mm. book written by Boston, Boston University professor by name Carl Rock, which yep. about teaching Greek in Greek. Mm. It was fantastic. The students loved it. They, but they went much slower. Uh, mm. I was conver converted. The next year for teaching the class myself, I ordered Rock. And I discovered that Rock himself had put out a second version, a second edition, in which he himself had abandoned the method. <laughs> yeah. wow. It was too interestingly too hard on the students, as 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 as, as mm. much as the the deductive method is designed to um, put the effort on to put, put the work on the students. The inductive method turns out to be even harder for them because they have to be trying to guess all the time. What mm. are the rules behind this? And at mm. their age, children are, little children are fantastic at this. 20 year olds are not as good. <laughs> <laughs> they get 
it depends. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for these comments, and thank you again, Chris, for your wonderful survey. So another round of applause for you. Thank you.